Well, I'm so glad to be here and so grateful to this wonderful library, which has been my roost for probably something like 60 years, because when I used to live in New York many years ago, I would come and go into one of those high rooms, right, where you could write, and this was long before laptop computers, so it was just, you know, pen and ink and yellow pad and so on. Anyway, this is going to be very informal and probably not real long. And what I'm going to try to do is engage all of you to ask me any questions that come to mind. I'll do a little reading, I'll do a little talking, I'll give you some opportunities to write if you feel like doing that. And just hope that we all get to know each other a little better. I'm very pleased that two of my colleagues from Sarah Band Books, my publisher, are here with us today. That's a special treat for me because they're only in New York pretty briefly and they found town to do this. So the first question that usually comes to people's mind is how can you write about a tragedy that affects you so closely, which is my younger brother? Part of it is the passage of time. He died in the early 60s at the age of 21. That's a long time ago. And I'm not sure I could have written this memoir any earlier in that long process, because as we all know, we've all lost people. At first, it's just too overwhelming as an emotional experience to even think about how you could shape it so that it would have meaning for other people. For me as a writer, the whole reason to write personal stories, which is what I've done now in this is my second memoir, is to make this kind of very personal story have some meaning for other people. Otherwise, it's just something you might jot down for your grandchildren, but it wouldn't be what you expected the public to take much interest in. Hello. So I thought of first asking all of you to think about the need for objectivity, particularly when you're writing a family story. I think it takes a degree of objectivity to reach towards art, which is what we're always trying to do. So with that in mind, I'm going to read you not the prologue, but a little bit from chapter one. A little boy, a little boy with frail blonde hair, not curly, but wavy, almost to his shoulders, and not yet cut short. A little boy in short pants, shirt untucked, shoelaces dangling, as he sits in the back seat of the family station wagon, staring out the window. The station wagon, driven by our mother, is gliding down the twisting road that leads to Frankfort, the Kentucky state capital. A steep limestone bluff falls to the right of the road that descends to the town and the Kentucky River. At a break in the bluff, a scenic overlook, our mother pulls off the road. Our two older brothers reach for the doors, but there is no time to cut out. The, step will be, the stop will be brief. In the back seat, I am watching my little brother. He is staring at the dome of the state capitol below the bluff. The dome flashes in the afternoon sun, 215 feet high. It is the tallest building the boy has ever seen. Stately paired ionic columns support the dome above the square mass of the Capitol building itself. Our mother explains that they are Corinthian columns identified by the crowns of carved leaves and flowers. A classic scholar at college, she knows her columns. The little boy doesn't seem to hear. He is staring at the gilded dome. If that isn't beautiful, nothing is, he says. Our two older brothers guffaw. They have already seen something of the world. I do not laugh. I have not seen anything in the world. And I know how tender my little brother has been from the very beginning when I knelt by his bed on the day of his christening and saw him copy with his tiny mouth the old excitement I was making. I want to shield him from our older brother's cheering, but then I realized that Jonathan is not listening. He is absorbed in the beauty of the gilded dome. 
I was and am the big sister. This is my story of my little brother, Jonathan Worth Bingham. And this is the photograph of that christening scene. I don't know if you can really see it. But what was interesting to me was that he seemed to be imitating the way I had, was moving my mouth. Whether he was really imitating me or not, who really knows. So that degree of objectivity, which led me to turn this into a story rather than just a recitation of my personal grief about the loss of this young man, is what I would really like you to think about. And in the course of thinking about it, I'm a great reader of poetry. I hope all of you do read poetry. It's essential. Come in. And I thought of these lines from Emily Dickinson, which I'm sure some of you know. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. The stiff heart questions, was it he that bore and yesterday or centuries before? That's the degree of objectivity we as writers need to reach before we can begin to delve into this very emotional material. So I wanted to ask, if any of you have had the experience, either through writing or through recollecting, of turning a very personal experience into something that perhaps has meaning for other people. Does anyone have an example of that that they would like to share with us? Yes, please. Well, it's not been published or anything. That's a that matter. Yes, go ahead. Anyway. And I apologize for the um, My mother, who was a longtime member of the Society Library, died suddenly and unexpectedly the night before last November. Uh, sorry, I'm so tired. Last Thanksgiving. And I was living with her for many, many years. And I found her. And um, I am still in shock and lonely grieving. And I am a writer as well as yoga instructor. And my name is Jennifer Lauren Lack. And I, at the behest of a friend of mine who I, I couldn't get out of my deep pit of despair and grieving um, suggested that I write poetry and I am not a poet, I am other things, but I'm mm -hmm. so there's no there was no expectation of myself. And he said just write anything, just anything. And so what I found myself writing was uh, the stuff that I was going through. And every single night since then I have written something that has been coming into something that is called um, the Morning Poem Series. And it's not edited, it is not censored. I send it out just to a couple of people, that's it. No one judges it, no one does anything with it. I went to Harvard, so then I have another thing creative writing, and this means a lot to me. I don't care. And, but my friend, a Swedish artist, said at the end of the year, you will have a book, and you will then deal with it. They're just writing, mm -hmm. and it's been helping me to no end. Oh, congratulations, that's a wonderful <coughs> story. And as you say, no matter what happens to it, it served a very good purpose in helping you through the stages of this grief and helping you to turn it into something else called poems, right? That's quite remarkable. Has anyone else had an experience at all like that? Can I just add one thing? Yes. Sorry, to my total surprise, because I've been so open to whatever comes out of, I do it on my phone actually. Um, a lot of times my mother writes to me oh, really? in her voice. And so whether or not, whatever one believes, whether or not it's actually her writing to me through my hands or whether it's my imagination of her writing to me, it's beautiful. It's a dialogue and sometimes it's her speaking to me. Her speaking to you, yeah. yeah. I tend to believe that. I think the dead do still have their voices. Absolutely. Uh, they still communicate with us, maybe not in ways we expect, maybe not in the words that we're used to, but in some way they do communicate with us. And I felt writing this book, even though my brother has been dead for so many years, that he was communicating with me, not very directly but with the sense that he wanted me to tell this story. Because if I don't tell it, nobody will. He was not well known, he, had, he was way too young to have created any kind of impression on a lot of people. So he is now completely forgotten, 
except for this book, because coming from the kind of family that I grew up in in Kentucky, they don't keep photos around of people who've died. Once that person has died, you don't see anything. They're gone. Oh, wow. And so there's no excuse for saying, oh, do you remember Jonathan when and so on? Because the visual link is not there. And I think that's very familiar with certain conventional privileged families who really think such things maybe should never happen to them. Maybe we're just too important and too white and too good and we don't have tragedies. Mm -hmm. Well, as we all know, tragedies afflict everyone. In fact, one of the things that my mother taught me early on, she was a classic scholar at Radcliffe, she graduated in the 1920s, was a phrase, and I don't really know where it comes from, but the translation is the tears in things, that there are always tragedies. We don't want to recognize that, it's hard on us. But that's part of life. It's not this exceptional thing that you have to be surprised, you know, that this would happen to you. It happens to everyone in one way or another. And I think that's such very important material for your writing. Um, and one another way, in addition to what I was speaking about objectivity, to turn this into a story that has meaning for other people is the historical context. And I find when I teach workshops that a lot of writers have never really thought much about the historical context. But when you think that my little brother was born in 1942, and this was, of course, at the beginning or close to the beginning of World War II, uh, which meant that our father, with the tradition in that family of military service, volunteered and was sent abroad. He was in England and also in the Pacific till the end of the war. So he was gone for three years. That was the first three years of this little boy's life. Nobody talks about this, but one of the costs of war is what happens to these children who may be very small when their fathers, and now of course also their mothers go off, but it has a profound implication for their whole attitude towards life later on their feelings of being vulnerable, of being easily abandoned, uh, mystified by who this person is who has disappeared and then reappears. And I remember when our father reappeared in 1945 and we went to what was, where you went to meet people in those days, which was a train station on an airport. And Jonathan, this three-year-old, when this man picked him up, began to scream because from his point of view, this was a total stranger. Why is a stranger picking me up? And I don't think their relationship ever really recovered from that because again, it was something that people didn't talk about, didn't recognize. It was just, oh, he'll get over it. But I'm not sure he ever really did get over it. Has anyone had that experience? Yes, please. Um, well, I'm uh, thinking of two things. I lost a stepson who was driving in, actually, he had just finished Michigan Summa Cum Laude, and he was the center. He had two older brothers, and two young kids. So he was like the pinwheel, right, which everybody adored him. He called him Mr. Perfect. But anyway, he died in a roommate accident. And nobody speaks about it. And of course, he had a wonderful mother who had a, a deal with it. But, Nobody else, and I'm not the one to, you know, a stepmother to bring it up. But I think about him all the time. And last week I was up at Yale um, to see an art show with a friend who just was someone who's in her life for 25 years. You know, mm -hmm. She's my age. I introduced her this day. And she can't get over it. And I mentioned something about uh, my ex husband and something about coming back to Yale on this beautiful day. And, so, yeah. and she said, why are you talking about that? I mean, he's been dead for years. Or, you know, so people, if you try to just speak to get it out, or you're thinking about it, and you want to make conversation, they get very upset. Yeah, they don't want to. You don't know where other people have been, uh, how they've been brought up. And, 
Yeah. Yes. Well, this is a little bit off the subject, but what I loved about your book was that you were talking about people who couldn't talk about anything, and you had great restraint yourself as a writer when you, when you when you wrote about them. And I was, you know, the the response could have been this this outpouring. It was an outpouring, but it was very measured beautiful outpouring that was controlled that I think they gave you in some way. You were rebelling against it by talking, but you you held the whole thing in check so perfectly. And then when we found out about the ski, the, the whole thing with the ski accident, everything just uh, dovetailed for me just yes. perfectly. I was just sitting there crying. Oh. Yeah, and I loved your book. I and I, I, I love. I read it a while ago, but I and I still I still think about it. I give it to my friends. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, I'm so flattered. Thank you so. Oh, much. you're welcome. Can I say one other thing Please. about loss? Um, this is a bizarre story of loss, but before I was born, my sister lost one of the, her fingers on her hand, and um, we were never allowed to speak of it. We were never allowed to look at it. Although she played piano, she learned how to type. No one ever spoke about the finger. And I know it's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And then she, well, she didn't like me particularly, but about 18, she was, she was about 23 and I was 18. And we were having one of our rare conversations. And I said, I wish it had happened to me instead of you. And she said thank you and she liked me after that oh good it turned things around well no it didn't turn things around but it, we had a moment that yeah. we never had had before i can't oh, know it didn't turn things around at all did you ever learn what had happened to her? oh i know what happened nobody wants to see it. it's, it's too gross oh. um well gross is what we writers deal in right? <laughs> there's nothing that we hold back on because the I'll ball. tell everybody if they want to know. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and tell All them. All right. So. My, he, remember the old-fashioned lawnmowers? Yeah. And my father turned his back. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. The push kind of lawnmower. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we can imagine yeah. from that one. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes. I just wanted to say, is this something to do with the fact that each culture probably has a way of dealing with these things? Yes. Like the British, you know. Have a step up yeah. But in America, because we combine so many cultures, is this why it sort of gets yes, and more confusing? Yes, and there are different attitudes in the different cultures. I live in New Mexico, and one reason I have lived there for 30 years is that we are very much influenced by the Pueblo Indians, whose, whose Pueblos, villages are all around Santa Fe. So before COVID, they would invite us white people to be witnesses at their ceremonial dances. I haven't done that since COVID, and I'm not sure they'll ever do it again. But it was a way of bringing a very different interpretation of what reality means to this primarily Anglo town that has grown up there in the middle of the desert. And one thing that's very interesting about the Pueblo people is that they feel, they feel that death is just the next stage. Mm -hmm. And I know there are other religions that also promote that. So there isn't the very extensive warning that we go into. They don't make a big to-do about funerals. It's just the next stage that this person is passing into, which is something I, as a Christian, try to hold on to. It's not always easy to hold on to, but try to hold on to. So, um, now I'll read you a little bit more about what happened next. This is not his older brother's story, not his much younger sister's story. She gave me the records and photographs that remain, uh, remain from Jonathan's life, not his friend's story, mine partly based on memory with its inevitable distortions, deletions, and illusions, partly drawn from the small collection of letters, photographs, photographs, and school reports, which our mother began to collect in 1942, when Jonathan was a sickly baby. 
the fourth of what would become five siblings. He was conceived in wartime during father's brief leave in 1941 and absorbed from the moment of his conception our mother's loneliness. Father would be stationed first in Washington and then overseas until 1945. Four years, four crucial years in the lives of his children, most crucial for the youngest, Jonathan, who didn't recognize his father when he finally came home and cried bitterly when this strange man tried to hold him. Now, as you know, this raises a big issue because how could I possibly know that Jonathan absorbed our mother's loneliness? How could I possibly know? I can't know that. What I do know is that she was historically lonely and even hysterically lonely while our father was gone. And I certainly absorbed her loneliness. And so therefore it seems acceptable to imagine that this very sensitive little boy also absorbed her loneliness. And that, as always, the effect of absorbing an adult's feelings about something is very important because it tends to shape the younger person's attitude, for instance, towards loneliness. Um, certainly I learned from our mother that loneliness is something you should avoid at all costs even if it means being constantly with people you don't even like that much. <laughs> and I know COVID raised some of this for some of us, and then you had to shed those people, right? So it had, a, instead of the other way of looking at loneliness, which is very prominent, certainly in Buddhism, that loneliness is an opportunity. It's a chance to get quiet and go a little deeper instead of trying to flee to some crowd so that you won't have the experience anymore. Have, has any of you written or thought much about loneliness? Yes, you want to say yeah. something? The cure for, lon for loneliness is solitude, right? Yeah, that's right. Who said that? I don't know. Well, <laughs> I think I've about it all the time. Somewhere. Yeah, the yeah. cure for loneliness is solitude. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. Is there any way to write about loneliness? This is a tough subject. If you think about, yes, please. Well, I just think that when you write about loneliness, you can't be self-conscious. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think that you can't worry about what people are going to say. I think that you have, that you write about loneliness with the humility and not with, you know, a, even though this sounds con contradictory, um, when I write about loneliness, I don't write about it as if I'm posting. Mm -hmm. about how I can do this. Yeah. And so it's, it's, um, it's, uh, I, I feel that it's, um, a deeper level of, of, of portraying who you are. Yes. Yes. Do you write? Yes. I'm not write. a professional writer. No. Do you, what, do you write poetry or prose? I write mainly normal. Really? And I write about my family and I write about people that I meet. Yeah. And um, I'm here because uh, actually a, a member of this library died a few weeks ago, who I was very close to. He was a very well known writer in her genre. And um, I want to write something for her more. Really? So, would this be a short memoir? Is that what you're imagining? <laughs> well, I'm imagining a, a five minute. vignette on this woman's life and how she affected me and others and also giving um, sort of a window at, inside her. She's, she was a very contrary person to me, but uh, opened up a part of herself to me. So trying to do, look at the different windows, you know, through the different mm -hmm. windows and, and give, give an mm -hmm. honest mm -hmm. view. Yeah. Um, Yes. And contrary, people can be very interesting. Well, yeah, that's what I'm attracted to. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Now, one thing that I'm always curious about when you're talking about this kind of writing or any kind of writing, when you're writing, do you visualize her? Yes. And describe, what, what do you remember her looking like? Well, she just died recently, but I, I, I actually, <laughs> she's sort of a Catherine Hepburn type. Mm -hmm. And she um, uh, 
very statuesque, very New england -y looking. Um, when I, I know it's not an adjective. Um, uh, and, and very, very good posture. Mm -hmm. And I never, uh, it's funny, I knew she, I knew she was 71. I know that she always had her hair perfectly brown. And, um, and and always, and also talked, you know, talked in a very soft manner. Mm -hmm. But you know, somebody could say, you're, you're wonderful. And with that same voice say, you are not making any sense what's wrong with you. <laughs> so, you know, and that's sort of what I want to, and yet, know that this person is um, a very, Affecting and effective person in so many people's lives. How's that? <laughs> it sounds <laughs> interesting, <laughs> right? Very, very. Oh, thank you. Very, very. Did very, you, very yes. me. Did she say that again? We couldn't hear it. You couldn't hear it. Did you oh, say no, that last? I the said less. She, that she was a very, that she was a, a, affecting and effective person. Oh, uh -huh. yes. yeah. Good summation. Has anyone else come up with a vivid visual image of someone that you want to write about or are writing about? No visual images. Because this, is, I think, is one of the things you want to develop as you're writing. Um, you can begin with a detail. Often there will be a detail that stands out for you, such as uh, her hair was always a mess or his shoes were never polished. Something trivial that stands out on which you can perhaps begin to build a visual portrait. I think it's very hard to write about someone whom you can't visualize. Because there's a kind of unreality there, kind of a blank there. So sometimes, even at the very beginning of what you're working on, just set down a few adjectives. Maybe you can't really connect them yet. But just a few adjectives that begins to bring this person vividly to mind. The other thing we don't often think about is the sound of someone's voice. And this is really crucial because I've had the experience, and I'm sure you all have had it, of liking someone and thinking, God, why does she have this horrible voice? And it doesn't mean a horrible person. But it does mean something about the character that has formed this voice. What that is, you would have to speculate because you don't know. It might be partly where this person grew up, partly the kind of education that she or he had, or it may be something totally mysterious. I remember when I first went east to college in the 1950s, and uh, I don't think anyone at Harvard, as it was, as it became, Radcliffe, but it became Harvard, had ever met anyone from Kentucky before. It was very New England and very snobbish. And people used to ask me if I wore shoes. <laughs> Here I was coming out of privilege in Kentucky, but they just couldn't imagine privilege coming out of a place like that where they'd only heard about Appalachia and, you know, little Abner and all that. <laughs> and it embarrassed me terribly, as you can imagine, and led me to wonder if I could get rid of my accent. Because that also caused a lot of laughing when I would finally get up the courage to speak in class, which didn't happen very much because it was too intimidating. But I then decided, being somewhat stubborn, as I'm sure you know, that I really wanted to hang on to this accent, that it was part of who I am, and if it makes people laugh or question or assume, then that's just their issue and not my issue. So again, when you're thinking about this person that you're d deliberating about, thinking about writing about, the other detail that really helps is the sound of that person's voice. Yes. You did get rid of your accent. Well, to some to degree. some degree, you did. Yeah, I'm from Louisiana. I got rid of mine from some degree. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been many years since I've lived in Kentucky, so if I didn't get rid of it, it would partly. It would really be kind of astonishing, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, I don't hear it every day, thank God. I don't want to hear it every day or even every other day. 
um, I'll read on a little from a little further in this memoir. So this young man had a privileged golden upbringing, which some of you have read about. And as we know, at some point you have to emerge, you may not want to, but you have to emerge from the bubble of privilege and realize that it was a bubble and that most of the world is lies outside of that bubble. Some people negotiate that better than others. It depends on the personality. So he went to Harvard. That was the family tradition. It's pretty miserable at Harvard. I think it's a miserable place. Well, oh, thank you. Yeah, did you want to say something about that? No, I was. <laughs> thank you. Um, because it's, there is a certain kind of person who in those days went to those institutions and it was kind of a narrow definition. Maybe it's changed a little bit now, I don't know. Anyway, while he was at Harvard, and this is the historical context, it was the late 50s, early 50s, 60s, and it was when the Harvard administration in their flawed wisdom mm -hmm. hired two men to teach in the psychology department. Timothy Albert and right. Mr. Leary. They lasted for a couple of years. While they were at Harvard, they were given absolute free reign for the first development of LSD. I'm sure all of you have heard about this or read about this. So they were not supposed to use this to experiment on undergraduates, but gradually things got more and more relaxed. So they did begin to experiment on undergraduates. And a lot of these young men, as they would have been, really were not prepared, didn't have any idea how to deal with this, what were the repercussions going to be. And it led to some disasters, which Harvard was very eager to cover, needless to say. In fact, I remember hearing, and it may have been just a rumor, that one of these young men who took, was exposed to this experiment was so disoriented that he walked into the Boston subway the wrong way and was run over by a subway. I'm not sure, and here again is where I couldn't really just state that Jonathan had some experience with LSD, because I had no, no reason to think that was so, except that it was so prevalent, and that his roommate, who he was absolutely devoted to, did get deep into it. So it's one of those possibilities, and this is the interesting thing about writing memoir. You don't have to be absolutely certain. You can say, this may have happened. I don't like using that form of verb. I'd rather say this did happen. But there's sometimes when you can't really say this did happen. Certainly, whatever was going on around college at that time, had a deep experience on everybody who was there, even the ones who didn't actually become part of these LSD ex experiments. So when my sister gave me the, whatever was left, the few papers and letters from Jonathan's life, she also gave me the only journal he ever kept. And it was his last three months at Harvard in his junior year. And it was almost written in code. What's hard to remember now is that nobody ever dealt with what they really felt. <laughs> certainly true for women, but also true certainly for some young men. You just tried to go on, just go on, keep functioning somehow, and bury everything that's upsetting and, and disconcerting and complicated. So his journal was quite disappointing in that I had to really translate it as though it was cold. So when he would refer to the terrible experience last fall, well, what was the terrible experience? I have no idea. And I didn't feel I could jump from that into saying it was a terrible drug experience. I felt that was too big a jump. And you will encounter this in your writing, that there is sometimes something you just can't even though it seems likely, you can't really assume because it's too big a jump. But whatever caused it, he became very unhappy at Harvard that spring of his junior year. 
And finally, after a lot of back and forth and interventions from the parents and interventions from the college, he decided to drop out and go back home to Kentucky. I was at that point living in New York and I felt this was a terrible mistake. I knew how suffocated he might feel back there, that he would certainly be viewed as a failure by our parents and probably by other people too. And I just felt he was so fragile at that time that it was the worst thing that could possibly happen. Of course, as we know, trying to influence anybody's serious decisions is almost impossible to do. I did urge him to you know, travel um, and try living in Paris, get some kind of a job, have a year of experience in the real world to try to figure out what he wanted to do. But our parents were not in favor of that. So they made it clear to him that there would be no money. So if there's no money, you're not going to do it. Of course, there was plenty of money. But he didn't know that. He just assumed that really there was no money. And so this was out of the question. So I'm going to read you a little bit from what happened after he got back to Kentucky. I have no letters from Jonathan in the fall of 1963, and I did not see him again until Christmas. His life in Kentucky, as far as I heard about it, seemed to revolve around two classes at the University of Louisville and parties with old friends who were still in Louisville, some of whom had been in his Boy Scout troop. There was no Christmas play that year. Jonathan, who had written in the previous years, was not available. He was present in person at all the festivities, the family feasts, the church goings, the social gatherings, but to my horror, he was not there in spirit or in mind. I saw that when I visited over Christmas. The silence that had been so marked in his adolescence now seemed entrenched. He was very pale, thin, and entirely quiet sitting amongst us at the big dinner table with an abstracted look as though he was listening to far off music. He often ignored the conversation and when addressed directly took a while to answer and then vaguely. This was the behavior I had seen before and tried to dismiss, dismiss with a joke about Mr. Toad. His childhood nickname was Mr. Toad from Wind in the Willows and if you remember that book at all Mr. Toad is often just lost in some abstraction, which the other animals think is very funny. And they say, oh, that's just Mr. Toad. So we used to say about Jonathan, oh, he's just being Mr. Toad. But this was a new, exaggerated form. It was impossible. On the last evening of my visit in Louisville, before I went back to New York, I ran into Jonathan in the dark upstairs hall. He was vaguely heading somewhere when I stopped him to ask how he was. He replied blandly that he had just created a cure for cancer in his basement laboratory. I knew that lab, or one like it, that our older brothers had constructed when we were growing up with trays of test tubes and ingredients to make explosions and a doorknob wired to shock unwary visitors like me. I could not imagine the setting as a place to discover a cure for cancer, especially by a young man whose knowledge of science barely exceeded what he had learned in high school. I told him I did not believe that he had discovered a cure for cancer, and he became angry. Turning sharply away, he disappeared down the dark hall. It would be the last time I saw him. That raises a really crucial question for all of us writing about this kind of event, which is, do you pretend to believe what is clearly a delusion? It's so de destabilizing for that person if you say you don't believe it. And yet, do we have any right to forward something that seems so out of touch with reality? I don't know the answer to that. Has anyone dealt with something like this in writing? 
Um, yes. Well, I, I wasn't in writing, although I am a writer. But when my grandfather was going deaf, he lived with us, and he had olfactory uh, hallucinations. And he'd say, he, "I was really little," and he asked me whether I would hear the music, and I went along with it. And I said, "I, I could hear the music. You could. Hear I could the hear music. the music, and and we would dance a little bit and do oh. stuff like that." <laughs> but I, I went. I, I don't know if I would have gone along with the cure for. Maybe he was being sardonic. Well, you know, it's so it's so long ago now that it's hard to remember exactly what the tone was of it. But it may be that he thought he was telling me something funny, a little hard to believe. And a dear friend of mine whom I told this story to astonished me by saying he was telling you he was going to die because the cure for cancer is death. I oh. never thought of that until just today, and I'm not sure that it really makes a great deal of sense, but it is a completely different way of looking at it. Um, yes. When he went back to Louisville, did he become more involved in drugs, do you think? Or no, I don't think so, involved? because at that time, aside from the big city, <coughs> there really wasn't yet a lot of drug oh, trafficking. Yeah, it was an enormous drug. amount of drinking, but not, not much drug trafficking. I think he left that behind in Cambridge, mm -hmm. and I think it may have been partly why he decided he wanted to leave, because he felt it, you know, it was so ensnaring. Uh, there was so much talk about it, there was so much excitement about it, that he maybe would have been drawn into it. Yes? Um, I think when things like this happen, I mean, I have, pe I have people in my life who have said things to me that one might consider delusional. Mm -hmm. However, I think that um, I don't know that much about your relationship with your brother. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying, you know, you're telling us that he said this to me when I read the book, I'm sure, I'll find out yeah. more. But if, but if he was, if he was a partner of crime with you versus um, someone who maybe did not have that much communication. Mm -hmm. So in one sense it might be a wink wink, in another sense it might be cryptic. So I think sometimes when you have, yeah, I, I look at my relationship with the person, what they perceive to be to them, when somebody tells me something like that. And then we don't usually save people. I, I mean, what I feel is that and when I see that happening, I adjust. Mm -hmm. I adjust to that person's perception. Yeah, which is wise. Could you hear that? I know that's a little hard to hear a little bit. Could you hear it all right? Yes. Good, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Well, you mentioned, you, you don't make a big point of it, but you bring up the, the fact that of his, uh, he said he might, might have been gay. Mm -hmm. um, you, don't, you don't dwell on it or anything, but do you think that that, could have, uh, I, 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 I was taken by, by that observation yeah. and, yeah. and it would have been, you know, then a terrible, terrible. a terrible weight terrible. on him. It's hard for us to realize now well, how yeah. terrible that would have been would in have that been conventional In the South especially. Society. It's yeah. still terrible in the South. Yeah, still. still to this yeah. minute. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's every reason to believe that if, if he had lived in a better time, maybe he would have been able to come out of the closet. And this is another way of connecting with the bigger family story. I didn't learn until maybe 30 years ago that our father was bisexual and had a very important relationship with a man that went on for many years. I didn't, that was not something that was ever discussed, of course. Uh, mother accommodated it as best she could. And I think if Jonathan had had any idea that this was something that had already happened in his family, it might have meant that he could maybe, maybe express his feelings in some way that would have been a relief to him. Uh, that's the terrible toll of family secrets. This is something we've been talking about a good deal in the last 20 or 30 years, that you think it's just a private matter, but it isn't, because that silence is toxic. 
and it affects people generations down the line, even though they don't literally know what is being repressed. That's one of the fascinating things to me about human nature. We pick up on all kinds of things that we're not supposed to know, that are not directly expressed, and it affects us even in ways we may not necessarily understand at the time. Has anybody written about family secrets? Yes? Um, may I ask a question about your problem? I mean, did he have a psychiatric evaluation or it wasn't done in your circle at the time in Kentucky? Did you say that again? I couldn't quite did understand. he have a psychi psychiatric evaluation? Was he evaluated by a psychiatrist? Oh, was yes, he was. He, he was. was. What, what, once. Once. <laughs> but what, what really ruined that is that I know this because of the letter my father wrote about it. The psychiatrist was immediately in touch with our father to tell him everything that Jonathan had said. That's oh. not professional. No, it's not professional at all. Right. And it, it meant, because I think Jonathan was aware of the fact that this might happen, that I'm sure he said very little to yes. this doctor. Uh, there is a very interesting study by a French neuropsychiatrist mm -hmm. who studied the effect of women pregnant during the war. Yeah. And what how the baby Oh yes. Has. And you can see uh, on the brain you can see the reaction and how uh, certain part of the brain shrink. A little bit, but get developed again when the mother is reassured and gets better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I think it all. I think the war did affect him in the womb. In the womb, yes. In the womb. What and her depression and her terrible agitation about can can I get to London to see my husband? Of course, she couldn't in the middle of World War Two. And what is he actually doing there? Because that's when he formed his relationship with this man that he was involved with for many, many years. And she probably had some sense that that was happening. And her misery at being stranded in Kentucky with all these things happening over which he had no control and couldn't even be very sure what was actually happening. I think that all did affect him. Mm. Um, yes. Do you think that it was better for her that you know, on, on some kind of subconscious level, that it was a man who was her rival and not another woman. Yeah, I, you I, know, this comes up a lot. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I, I don't really have any conclusion to draw from that. Um, I think any primary relationship is very much impacted by this third person. Whether it's a man or a woman, I'm not sure it really makes very much difference in the end. It may make a difference to the wife, though. If she's been raised, as women were in those days, with great competition with other women. Right, right. You know, right. who is the fairest of us all? We all remember that. Uh, then possibly it would renew all that sense of being especially challenged by another woman. Uh, which wouldn't have been aroused by being challenged by another man. I don't know. That's all, you know, now beyond speculation. I think it's not something I really have any business writing about because I don't think I have enough understanding of it. So then we get to the end of this book. Oh, and I did want to ask her, someone asked me about my relationship with Jonathan, right? I think you did. I was really cast as the little mother. I was five years older, and since in that kind of big Southern family, the older child is expected automatically to take charge of the next one down. It isn't, oh, would you like to do this, or can we pay you for babysitting? No, it's just automatic. This is your, this is your responsibility, because really there was nobody else. Our parents were, had way too exciting a life to be bothered with little children. So I felt very responsible for him from the day he was born, and as a result tried to do what I, in my limited understanding, felt was mothering, which is a lot of badgering, a lot of criticism, a lot of why don't you do this or why don't you do that, none of which, of course, had any effect. 
And it was many years before I realized that that's a kind of hopeless approach. We all learn that sooner or later, usually with our own children, but I learned it with him. Um, and I remember probably one of the most crucial experiences I had with him. He was sent to boarding school. That was, again, a family tradition in Massachusetts. And normally, parents, if somebody's going to take this 14-year-old to this new environmental environment, it would be parents. Well, for some reason, our parents were too busy to do that. So I was the one who took him to boarding school. And I know this because I wrote a letter to our parents about how hard it was on him, that he was very uncertain where he was, what was his situation, who were all these people, and he didn't want to stay there. He wanted to go back with me to Boston, and of course I couldn't take him back with me. And one of those heartbreaking moments when I really felt I had abandoned him. He ended up having being okay there, but those those first weeks and months were extremely difficult. And that again, it's a little bit like: do you encourage or listen to the delusions? Do you give in to somebody who is miserable and wants you to take him away or take her away, or do you hew to the line, which is you have to stay here? That's what's been planned, and paid for, and so on very complicated and difficult decision, particularly for, I was very young at that time, I wasn't even 20, so very difficult to make the right decision. But I always felt badly that I couldn't take him away from there. On the other hand, he ended up liking it. So if I had taken him away from there, if there'd been some alternative, he maybe would have missed what he learned from growing to like this boarding school and fitting in and doing pretty well and making a lot of friends and so on. Very complicated. So now he's back at home in Kentucky. He's been there for about six months. Why being miserable is illusion? Oh, it's not. You just said it. No, miserable, being miserable is not an illusion. What illusion? I know that. Or a delusion. It's not. But it's, it's, it's fact. I think right. if I said that, I misspoke myself. Oh, I knew he was miserable, and he knew he was miserable. The question for me was whether I should t somehow take him away from there, which I didn't do. Well, I really couldn't have done. I, I don't know what I would have done with it. Okay, so... Um, what had happened on a hilltop in Kentucky had been coming for a very long time. Little by little over time, the details emerged. Three days earlier, a wet day, was the eve of the Boy Scout reunion Jonathan planned to hold in the old barn on the hill. It was meant for the boys from the troop, now young men, who had shared picnics, campouts, competitions, and medals. The barn, out of use, was derelict. There was, no, there was no electricity, and electricity was necessary for lights and music at the party. Jonathan called the electric company. They said they'd come in a week. He couldn't wait that long. He went to ask Mother what he should do. I imagine her in the small, discreet bathroom where she often was when one of us went looking for her, perhaps glancing in a little mirror over the sink as she untangled a tin roller from a strand of her blonde hair. Now, you all will remember or have heard about the fact that this period in the late 50s, early 60s, women often used these tin rollers, and you would never think that would happen at a later period. That was so much set in that period. In fact, I think some women even slept on them, can you imagine? Jonathan told Mother the problem. They needed electricity, and he explained that he believed he could do the job. Would she agree? Apparently slightly distracted, not really understanding, and with boundless faith in the mechanical ability of her beloved youngest son, she gave him permission. 
he would have needed spurs to shimmy up the pole near the barn. Mother later bemoaned the lack of a sign nearby, warning people not to climb. If there had been a sign, there would have been no accident, she thought. Of course, most sensible people, seeing the tangled wires to and from the transformer at the top of the pole, would not have been tempted to climb. That afternoon, Jonathan strolled down the lawn from the big house with seven of the young men he'd grown up with, past the big brick garage and the coal frames where Mother started her annual, to the electricity pole on the top of the little hill. He was carrying tools, wire cutters, wrenches. He set his first spur firmly into the base of the 20-foot pole and began to climb, digging into the wood all the way up to the top. One of his close friends scampered up behind him. Jonathan planned to cut an old, presumably dead wire and attach a live one, running from the transformer directly to the barn. Did he hesitate? the wire cutter in his right hand. He reached for what he thought was the dead wire. As he cut into it, there was an explosion, tongues of flame and a rain of sparks. I need help, he shouted. His friend snatched at Jonathan's pants legs but was afraid the voltage would pass through him as well. Jonathan's grip released and he fell. Mother and father, taking their Saturday afternoon walk, thought they saw something dark fall from the sky, like Icarus, and mother urged father to hurry up the hill. Around the pole, there was scrambling and confusion. Jonathan lay crumpled on the wet dirt. Mother thought at first he might have been knocked out unconscious, but father felt for a pulse. He had seen death. He knew. Has anyone ever tried to write a scene of that kind? Actual death, a scene of actual death, you have. You want to tell us about it? No. <laughs> well, I, 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 I wrote that. a scene where someone was murdered in a racial incident in Louisiana. Really? Yeah. 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 And again, you know, you tried, I, I, I was not there. You weren't there to see so it. So I had to really visualize these details. I know exactly where it happened. I had some sense of what mother would do, which seems incredible now, but because she wanted so badly to believe that this son who seemed to have messed up was going to be fine, she had to think that he had the good sense to know what he could do and what he could not do. And she had to live with that for the rest of her life. And I think it's why she took she took some comfort from the idea that there should have been a sign. Well, as we know, there are no signs on these poles. You know, I don't think the electric companies really feel it's their responsibility to put up such a sign because it's clear that you don't climb up these poles. So why did he do that? This raises a lot of complicated issues about mental illness, about delusion. Where is the line? When does one cross the line from delusion into actually acting out something that may cause you death? I mean, in a way, it's delusion when somebody drives 100 miles an hour in a car. They, that person is not thinking he's going to have a crash and die. Uh, it seems as though maybe he should think he's going to have a crash and die. But usually he gets away with it. And then one day he probably doesn't. So it raises some really complicated and interesting issues for the writer. Again, not to assume too much. Jonathan was never diagnosed. He had that one visit to the psychiatrist, which didn't go anywhere. So I was not willing to pin a label on it. A lot of people would pin a label. I think it's much more complicated than any label can express. Because we're all, I think, somewhat delusional. I don't know if all of you would agree to that, but I know I am. You know, we make mistakes about reality. Usually they're not fatal. But every time I cross 79th Street when the 
walk sign is not on. I think maybe I'm a little delusional to think I won't get hit. Fortunately, I haven't gotten hit yet. But, you know, we all make these little attempts to escape from reality if we can, even if it's just for a few minutes. Fortunately, we usually don't pay this high price, but sometimes we do. And is this part of just our human complexity to make these kinds of errors, to choose to climb the pole, believing it's all going to be fine? Or did he maybe climb the pole thinking it's not going to be fine? This is going to be the way out. I will never know. No one will ever know. But writing about it, I think, has value because it raises the issue for all of us, either for ourselves or for people we know and care about. What is the interpretation of this kind of act? And also very interesting to me that his friends didn't tell him, don't do this. That is Again, a question of a kind of blind faith in him because he did have the ability to make you believe he could do anything partly the result of privilege, as we know, and that you might believe that he could do anything. Um, that would, of course, lead to these now 80-year-old men wondering about their role in this situation. And one of the things that hasn't happened yet, I hope it will, is now that the book has been out for six months, some of these now elderly men will read it and let me know did, is this the way it happened? Was there something else? Did someone say to him, don't do that, that's not safe, we'll find some other way, or it's not wise to climb up that pole? Or did nobody say anything? Um, again, part of the um, scenery, part of the detail that I can imagine, but I can never be quite sure of because I wasn't there. And I've never heard from anyone who was there because, as I was saying to you, silence has long since closed over this event. I don't know whether any of them talked about it right after it happened, but certainly all these years later, the ones who are still alive are not talking about it. It's too far in the past. So I'm hoping this has been helpful to you in some ways. Yes. Um, I'm just thinking that there are so many incidences where people of a privilege lose a younger person. I, I remember sitting at dinner in another city and um, my family said, oh, see, your, your daughter was in the flight that went down over mm -hmm. Scotland. And my daughter could have been in England at that time. Okay? Sure. So I'm just saying, another another thing is a friend lost her, her daughter to suicide. And she kept saying, well, the window wasn't closed. And she kept going on and on. And it was the building's fault. And then one day she called a very wonderful woman. She said, you know, the window wasn't closed because my daughter kept opening the window. It, it took her until she realized her daughter had planned this. So I think when something like this happens, forgetting the person that is gone, the whole family is affected. Yes, indeed. And everybody deals with it differently. Yes, indeed. And, you know, guilt is not very helpful. I think we all felt, all in the family, and probably his friends too, some degree of guilt. But I think guilt stops you from thinking what might have happened because you, you begin to be so preoccupied with your own reaction and how terrible you feel and how you wish you had done something and so on. Whereas the useful thing, I think, is being able to have enough objectivity to imagine the situation and imagine what thoughts might have been going through Jonathan's mind when he said, I need help. As far as I know, it's the only time in his life he ever said, I need help. And that's another aspect, I think, of privilege, of white male behavior. You don't say, I need help, because it's an admission of vulnerability and weakness, and that's just not acceptable. So I wonder if there are any other questions, anyone who wants to talk about what you're working on? Well, there's any number of things, and I appreciate everyone's comments, and I just had thoughts and reflections as each of you spoken. I can relate to a lot. I was born 
1944 when my father was overseas. So like your brother, I didn't know my father until he was you know, until I was two and a half to stay yeah. on education book. So there's all these little pieces I've lost the son. But the question I have for the authors you know, really is so all of you talking about writing nonfiction. You're you talking about dealing with loss and grieving uh, and moving on from loss from personal experience in, in a sort of a, a non-fiction way. And I wondered what you thought about writing in terms of fiction. If you were to, what kinds of freedom there might be, or yeah. perhaps, in, perhaps aside from freedom, a greater requirement of objectivity, to use your word, if you were writing fiction, fiction. and you were describing loss and grieving. And yeah, that's a very interesting question. I do write fiction. Most of my books are fiction, short stories or novels. In this case, I think I felt really compelled to stick as close to the details as I could because the whole story had been silenced. I think in the case where the story has been more talked about, more known, I would perhaps have chosen to write it as fiction. And as you say, to have the greater freedom and also the greater objectivity, because I can right away, thank you for saying this, right away imagine scenes right. that I could have right. written as right. fiction that I couldn't write yes. in a memoir. I can imagine you know, that scene at the family dinner table, right. which I could have written about. Uh, any number of characters, detail. Yeah. Right. Any number of characters expressed yeah. in a variety of Yeah, things. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, that's a really interesting question, and I think a lot of it depends on how comfortable you are with writing fiction. I assume you've written some fiction? No. No? Just think, read it. Just read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much, and I'm here, yes. This might be a controversial question, but um, you seem clearly many, many, many years and even decades after the fact, I wouldn't say tortured by the death of your brother, but obviously moved enough or affected, let's just say, yeah. enough that you would take the time to write such a piece of work yes. and, and to talk about it, etc., and perhaps cry over it while you're writing, who knows, whatever. In any case, but obviously to inquire, right even now in this last hour, you, you've you're still asking questions yes. and i'm wondering why or or if i don't know you no that's all. a good and question no i haven't asked that question yet oh i don't know you or your writing at all yeah um i'm wondering if you've ever gone to a psychic or a medium or if you don't believe in that hogwash or anything like that to see if you could talk with your brother himself well, you know, I think I, I have some, I some interest in psychics. And as it happens, I live in the part of the world where there are quite a few people who mm -hmm. practice that profession. Mm -hmm. I've never done it, and I can't really even tell you why I haven't. Um, maybe a little suspicious, uncertain, or whatever. The reason that I have been just determined to write this book is because this is a story that has repeated and repeated and repeated in my family. And I have some dim hope that if the next generation, all these young people now in their 20s and 30s, knew some of these stories, it might help them to understand that this is really a family theme. And you can call it some kind of inherited insanity, you can call it privilege, you can call it money. It doesn't really matter what you call it, but I start the book with a list going back over two gener three generations of all the people on both sides of my family who have died in strange accidents or committed suicide. Because it's a very, very prominent pattern. And it is in many families. So I felt there's a chance. Now at this point, I don't think any of this younger generation has read the book. I doubt if they ever will. But there's a chance that if we can just tell these stories, maybe later generations will recognize the warning signs um, and perhaps be able to do something about it. That's my hope. Well, thank you all so much for wonderful. Thank you.